Hi guys, thanks for joining me in the studio. My name's Tom. In this video, I'm just gonna take you through a real-time full-length painting of a watercolor cheetah. This is just gonna be a great opportunity to look at using simple patterns of light and shadow to paint what might appear to be quite a complex subject. And also it's gonna be a fantastic opportunity to look at just the medium of watercolor itself and the different ways that we can kind of use it and thinking about paint consistency. If you like this video, please do consider subscribing. There's loads more to come. Don't forget to hit the notifications bell and the like button. And do feel free to drop me a comment to let me know what you think. And if there's anything else you'd like to see me talk about on the channel. I just wanna mention also that you can hop over to my Patreon teaching channel for lots more content at various different tiers. And if you just allow me for a moment to say that I also have plenty of Zoom demonstrations coming up now and plenty more in the future, even if you're watching this video a bit down the line, as well as ongoing Zoom courses and in-person courses. All of the places you can find me are linked in the description. Let's have a quick look at the drawing first. So, because I'm working on A4 size and I really want to have a lot of fun with the head, and the neck in particular. I've obviously cropped the drawing quite significantly relative to the reference photo just to allow me to focus on those. The very, very first thing I did was look at the overall head shape and its proportion in relation to the neck and the body and also the proportion of the depth of the head relative to the length of the head. So for me when drawing out, it's all about going from big to small shapes. It's the accuracy of those shapes, even though they're very simple that um, includes proportion and then beyond that we've got kind of the tilt and the angle of the shapes which gives us the the kind of character of the animal and the gesture of the animal and then beyond that I'm looking for alignment so you know where does the corner of the ear align with if I drew a horizontal line across or dropped a vertical plumb line down little things like that once I've got the big shapes in place and only when I'm happy with those, I go into the placement of the smaller shapes, like the features, really start refining the kind of external uh, line work just to kind of really get it nice and accurate and as I want it. And then beyond that, as particularly with the cheetah, I start to think about where the boundary of light and shadow is and also then the spots. And rather than drawing out all the spots, I draw out some of them, but then I look for the kind of rhythm of the way that the spots move around the form of the animal. And you can see that I've got lots of kind of curved lines there to give me that. I'm gonna quickly talk you through the materials and then we're gonna dive into the painting. So I'm working on an A4 gummed block. These are super convenient. You don't need to stretch the paper first. At the moment, I'm really loving the Bao Hong Professional 100% cotton watercolor paper. This is the rougher texture because I really like those broken brush strokes. Brushes, I'm keeping it very, very simple. I've got a size zero Jackson's Raven mop. This is faux squirrel hair, nice and soft and lively. It holds a lot of water and pigment, but also comes to a fine point. It's a great kind of brush to wash in the initial stages of this and also focus on the larger shadow areas. When I want a little bit more detail and a little bit more control, I just drop down to a size eight. Uh, Windsor & Newton Synthetic Sable Brush. Again, really beautiful little brush, nice and lively, lots of control. Um, and that's it for this particular one. I don't need much more than that. If I bring in any other brushes just here and there, I will mention them as I go. I'm using Holbein and Daniel Smith watercolor paints. The colours themselves, I'm going to use a very limited palette of one of each primary. I'm going to be using the Prussian Blue, which is a cool-ish, fairly uh, kind of muted blue. Uh, it's going to help just darken some of the colours for the spots and just give me a blue to balance the colours. I'm not going to let it dominate too much. This is going to be predominantly a warm painting and I'm going to be using Oriolin Yellow, which is a nice cool yellow, but because it's very, very kind of bright and clean and intense, it still gives lovely kind of uh, slightly muted but still very clean, clear, bright oranges, especially when I combine it with a quinacridone red. And again, quinacridone red is, is actually a slightly cooler red, uh, but because I don't want really, really vibrant oranges and because quinacridone red is fairly neutral but still very bright and clean, the oriolin yellow and the quinacridone red make some amazing colours together, which you're going to see in a minute. The quinacridone red though with the Prussian allows me to create a slightly more purpley feel. Let's just dive into the painting. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here we go. I'm gonna start off with the 
the lightest colour and the weakest colour, which is the Oriolan yellow. Loads of water in here, a good amount of pigment too, because I do want a strength of colour. And it's probably about uh, kind of milky coffee consistency. And what I'm just going to do here is kind of lay in some basic light colours and leave plenty of whites of the page. Although if there's lots of water in this yellow, it will also act as a light, but it's nice to have those lights of the page as well. So really what I'm doing here is painting the lightest tones, which is the white of the page and a very light yellow with lots of water. I know I'm going to go into shadow in this bottom left area, so I'm kind of purposely not going too dark down there uh, because I know I'm going to bring the shadow in later. I instantly forgot about the nice white down the front of the chest and under the neck, which can be a very light yellow is fine. It will, it will appear bright light uh, when the darks go in. But it can be very easy to overthink this first stage. I'm really just thinking very, very light. Next, I've dropped in a tiny, tiny touch of the quinacridone red. As I said at the start, I'm not after like a really bright, intense orange in terms of kind of strong, strong chroma. However, the lovely clean, clear quinacridone red uh, and the lovely clean, clear oreolin, when mixed together, do give a really beautiful kind of slightly muted, soft orange colour. Um, and what I'm doing at the moment is just bringing up the consistency of the paint to maybe full fact milk and just kind of washing it in there. When there's this much water in the washes, I know that the, the colours and the tone are going to dry that little bit lighter uh, and softer than I put them on. So don't be afraid of colour at this stage. And then you can see I drop in a really quite strong consistency um, of Oriolin into that mixture. So we're coming up to about single cream paint consistency, but because it's the yellow, it's not going too dark. Uh, and you can really see um, the intensity that that brings. So what I'm doing here is I'm bringing in kind of some of the deeper kind of half tones uh, and some of those colors that are the transition between what will eventually be the deeper shadow and the lighter areas. And now I'm using a mixture of kitchen roll and also just a damp brush to kind of pull out little areas. Where do I want a slightly softer transition between light and shadow? Where have I maybe put in a little bit too much tone or a little bit of the darker colour has kind of washed its way into an area I would prefer to keep light. So by using a nearly dry brush, you can see around the eye, I've just kind of pulled some of the pigment out again. And so I'm taking a little bit more care around the face because it's basically going to be the focal point and the area with the highest amount of refinement and definition. And as long as I keep things light and think about the whites of the page, as I move away from that focal point, uh, I feel that I can be a bit more broad with the brush strokes. And you notice when I want to intensify the colour, I obviously add in more pigment, in this case the yellow, which is giving us this lovely, like very, very yellowy, but with a slightly orange tinge. And it's the paint consistency that's so important. When I chuck in that really strong consistency of Oriolin yellow into the mixture on the palette, you can see it ever so slightly darkens it, but what it really does is intensify the colour and it moves it up to this kind of full fat milk, well, between full fat milk and single cream consistency of paint, which is when we start to get a really intense um, kind of colour and a slightly darker tone but it's still uh, a fairly light tone and especially by the time I put on the true darks in the painting these yellows will look significantly lighter but what I'm aiming for here is a night light, nice light wash lots of whites to the page and then these kind of blushes and hot spots of colour so a kind of blush and hot spot of a more orange colour on the um, on the head and then really thinking about just a slightly softer colour, but chucking a bit more red in there as we move around the rest of the animal. Um, but knowing that will probably go into shadow more. So that all completely dried off. Um, so we, we kind of missed that uh, a quickly cut then and it, it dried off. So because we're doing this kind of layered approach, the colour underneath needs to be bone dry before I go over the top. Different if we're working wet into wet, but if it's nearly dry and I start coming in over the top, we're going to muddy and disturb the pigment we're going to end up with 
not a very nice look to the watercolour. So bone dry if we're going to do this kind of two part stage of glazing. And what I'm doing here now, we're very, very free, very kind of carefree, but still considered uh, in the first stage. Now I am don't want to get bogged down in detail and um, I'm just using one colour and one tone, but I'm taking more care to really carve out the shadow shapes on the face. It's almost like we've laid in the lights, the highlights and the half tone. Now I'm coming in with a nice kind of transparent colour. And again, it's probably about full fat milk consistency, but it's got more quinacridone red in it. So the quinacridone red being a darker colour is darkening the tone ever so slightly. And this is what I like to do. Just find a simple pattern of shadow connect the shadows together as much as possible. What we don't want are lots of isolated areas of shadow. I'm looking to connect the shadow together, even if it's quite complex and um, need to be quite specific, accurate shapes. I'm still looking to connect those shadows. It's the shadows that hold the painting together. So kind of starting at the top, because I'm working on a slight tilt, I find the shapes around the face. I go fairly light to start with, where I kind of feel my way and find my way with it. Um, I've dropped down to the size 8 brush uh, as well. Um, oh no, sorry, I think this is a size 10 and I think I dropped down to a size 8 uh, a, a little bit later on. So the size 10 is a nice mixture of big enough to get some nice big washes, but when I need it to be a little bit more detailed, like when I'm going around the eye or a little bit more controlled, uh, it can give me that. But yeah, just one colour to start with. I slightly intensified the, the pigment as I moved over to the left hand side of the neck and the trick here is I want to keep a nice unified shadow shape. Uh, although there's going to be a change of colour and a change of tone throughout the, the shadow that's down the side of the cheetah's head, neck and even onto its shoulder blade and even down the side of the leg, I want to paint that as one united shadow, one kind of clean wash. So that we need to work when we're doing that with a little bit of a sense of urgency but if you notice, because I've started at the top and I'm keeping the wash very damp, as long as that edge of the wash at the bottom of the wash stays damp, I can pick up from there and just continue. So it gives the, the feeling of a nice big kind of unified wash. Um, paint consistency is really important. It was a little bit too watery there, so I'm coming stronger into like a single cream paint consistency and I'm connecting these areas of wetness as I go. However, I do want to create kind of variety or variegation within that wash. So I'm altering the colours as I go, maybe more yellow, more red. I'm also altering the paint consistency a little bit. So far, I've not brought any blue in apart from you may have seen me pick up a tiny little bit of a kind of cooler colour from the big messy left hand side of my palette. And I just introduced that into the neck area. Uh, that was just to create a cooler colour in amongst all of the warmth. And I kind of took that idea from the reference photo. So you'll notice that the reference photo is guiding me in terms of accuracy of shape where it's needed. It's guiding me in terms of the patterns of light and shadow, which are important in watercolour. But I'm not taking it too literally. Um, like the colours I'm intensifying significantly from the photo. I'm really warming them up quite a lot. Um, I'm not going to be painting every single spot exactly as it is in the photo. You can see now that I'm using the shadow colour from the other parts of the cheetah to paint the spots in the light areas. So you can paint the spots really dark in the light areas, but because I want to really emphasise the feeling of light and the feeling of warmth, I'm purposely making the spots lighter and warmer in the light areas of the cheetah than they will eventually be in the dark areas of the cheetah. So we get a change of tone of the spots as we move around the form of the animal to emphasize the form, the shape, the 3D-ness, and also to emphasize the feeling of light. If I was to just paint black spots all over, that could work, but it's gonna have a slightly flatter feel to it. We're not gonna get such a strong sense of light and form. It's just a nice little trick that I like to use. For the first time, I'm introducing a kind of very dark, kind of shadowy tone here. So this is the kind of the top part of my palette, which has a little bit of all the leftover colours in. But this would be the equivalent of adding the Prussian blue to the quinacridone red. It's got a slightly purple feel to it. If you decide it's too purpley and you want to subdue the purple, 
The best way to subdue colours is to add in their complementary or their opposite. The opposite or complementary of purple, which is made out of the red and blue, and because we're using a limited palette that only leaves one other colour, which is the complementary to the purple, which is yellow. And by adding tiny touches of yellow, we're going to bring that purple more and more subdued and kind of into the brown, uh, kind of subdued, purpley brown area of the colour wheel. And that's going to be perfect uh, at this stage. So it looks like a deep dark because it's the darkest thing on there, but we've got room to go darker. So the paint consistency is stronger now. I'm really working in that single cream paint consistency. And I'm working into an almost dry wash. So you'll notice that the marks I'm putting in are kind of staying where they're put and they've got some definition. But because the wash that I'm working into still has a little bit of dampness to it, it is giving us a nice kind of soft feeling. And this is another thing, if you've seen any of my other videos, I like to talk about a lot, which is that generally I like to work a little bit more wet and wet or damp on damp in the shadows. This gives everything a kind of fuzzy, slightly out of focus feeling. And then as we move into the light areas, you'll notice that my my marks or the edges become sharper. Uh, we have sharper kind of light edges between maybe the cheetah and the background or sharper edges between light and shadow. Um, and, and this is really taking what nature does, which is making the shadows very soft and blurry because they're lit by the ambient reflected or bounced light so because it's bounced around it's much weaker so it doesn't describe things as literally or as strongly as say the direct light which is hitting the front edge of the cheetah and in the light areas which because it's direct light creates like stronger harder edges and more definition so the level of um, softness and blending that will happen within a wash, in this case the shadow areas, is dependent completely on paint consistency. So the wetter the wash is and the more water I have in my brush, the much fuzzier the marks are going to be. They're going to be much more wet into wet and may even completely dissolve together. The closer to being dry that the wash on the page is, mixed with using a stronger consistency of paint, so less water and more pigment, we're going to get a slightly more defined mark, but it's still going to have a little bit of softness to it because there's a little bit of dampness on the page and there's a little bit of dampness in the brush. The stronger in consistency I bring up the paint in my brush, the less uh, dissolving into the existing wash on the page we're going to get. So the perfect example of that is these spots that I was painting just then. I'm using a kind of a double cream paint consistency with a lot of quinacridone red into what we might call a very slightly damp wash. Like it's still got a little bit of wetness there, a little bit of sheen, but it's definitely not like wet or even damp. It's kind of, um, sorry, or, or kind of moist. It's got that dampness to it. Again, if you want to learn more about the, um, the consistency of paint and how that affects your watercolour painting, then I would definitely hop over and check out one of my other videos which is on the watercolour clock and I talk about just paint consistency and, and how you get different effects with it. But you'll see now I'm starting to slightly darken some of the spots within the shadow, so I'm upping the consistency of paint, more Prussian blue, a little bit more quinacridone red, we're moving up into that kind of buttery paint consistency and I'm just picking one or two spots to drop in a slightly deeper dark. So I don't want all the spots to be the same shape. I don't want them all to be the same size. And I don't want them all to be the same tone. I'm trying to naturally create variety. The watercolour medium is doing a lot of that for me. But it still has to be considered. And I'm now coming into the face and just sharpening little areas up. Bringing in a little bit more definition with some sharper edges uh, and some stronger shadows. Uh, just pulling out a few little bits here and there. And so far, so good. I'm really liking the feeling of light and shadow. Uh, I like that I haven't gone too dark with the shadows. Really happy with how the spots are going. If I'd gone in any sooner with the spots, they'd, they'd dissolve into the existing wash and we'd end up with spots that are far, far too big um, for, for what I'm trying to achieve. So that is also a consideration. If I'd gone in any sooner with the spots into the damp wash, they would have dissolved too much and they would have, A darkened the shadow um, area too much, made the shadow feel too heavy, and they would have also been too big for what I'm trying to achieve. 
Okay, so the, the painting's actually moving along fairly quickly at this stage, and it's all born out of understanding this big pattern of shadow. Um, and, and it's a great example of how do we take a very complex subject, or one that appears to be very complex, like the spots make it appear more complex than it is. If I'm almost imagining, imagining it initially without all of the spots on there, and I'm just painting the large pattern of light and shadow. And actually, the large pattern of light and shadow is very simple. It does need to be accurate. We do want a variation of colour, uh, a little bit of variation of tone in there, but really that it is actually just a strong shadow shape down the side of the animal and a little bit of more care needed um, around the face. But always look for shadow first. Um, and I'm painting the lightest shadow and then dropping in the darks into it. So now I'm, I'm kind of trying to work out how dark do I want to go in these spots? Do I want to darken all of them? Do I need a few more little ones in between? The bigger ones and trying to create a bit more of an irregular feeling, dropping some dark into some of them, purposely making the spots a little bit further around the shape of the form of the animal over on the left hand side which is kind of more in shadow. Really thick strong consistency of paint there, a lot of Prussian blue, a lot of quinacridone red, making those darker and then notice how as we drift around the form of the animal I'm leaving some of the spots um, as more of like a dark ready purple um, and and then as we move into the light we already know that I'm making them kind of lighter there so there is a variation of tone within the spots you probably noticed that I've not painted as many spots on the cheetah as there are in the photo but I have tried to kind of consider the way that they curve around the form of the animal you know they kind of come up and out from the elbow whereas they come over and around the back of the the neck and the shoulder blades and that sort of thing. So just just not overly obsessing about it, but still having a consideration for the way that these spots move around the cheetah. All the time remembering that this area on the left is ultimately just the support act for the main event. Like, I don't want all of these spots uh, in the shadow areas to detract from the, especially the face, but the light area, the, the, the light flowing down the head, uh, the neck and onto the front of the animal, for me is what's interesting about this painting. Um, it's going to be different for everyone, but that's what I wanted to really capture. And um, anything away from that, I'm trying to state it a little less obviously um, to keep it uh, so it's not competing for attention with the main event, which is the head and the light. So I'm really going in now and uh, sharpening up the eye area. I took the same as approach kind of as the spots with the, the dark around the eye. It's such a prominent feature of a cheetah, it's really important. I kind of mapped it in earlier with that fairly dark tone, but I just felt like it, because it's the focal point, we can afford to have really deep, rich darks right, right next to the bright lights. And that's one way that we're going to draw attention to the focal point, which is the head. And we're going to look to the head generally first anyway, unless we've made an effort to uh, make it more subdued. But um, by putting that really deep dark in the eye, right next to the, the strong, sharp white lines uh, of the markings around the eye, that's really going to help draw our attention. It's one way to create a good focal point is bright light next to deep dark. Um, so that's kind of what's happened there and for me that's really brought in the form now we've got we've got the light area we've got the gentle medium shadows and now we have the really deep darks we've got the full tonal range and we're starting to be a bit more or see a little bit more contrast as a result I'm just kind of playing around with the idea of the background at the moment I want to give it a feeling of kind of sitting in the long grass not entirely sure about the, the bit closest to the cheetah's body. You can see that I didn't really like it, so I thought, ah, no, not working. The idea is right that I'm using a bit of shadow to carve out, or the negative shadow shape of the background to carve out the positive shape of a cheetah in quite quite a nice little area. I just made it too fussy, so um, kind of take it all out again and come back with a slightly drier brushwork um, and, and not overthink it so much, trying to just be a bit more fluid with the brush strokes and a bit a bit rougher and also not just create a perfect dark line um, around the cheetah. That's never going to look that good. It's going to give us that kind of cut out look. And strangely enough, having made what you might deem a bit of an error, kind of pulling it out again to the best of my ability and then popping a few darker lines back over the top, I like that far, far more uh, than what I had there initially. 
You see one of my lights uh, has just dropped out for a minute there. Uh, it will come back again. Uh, I decided to keep it in because I'm still painting in this moment. Um, I know you can't see it quite as well, but I'm, I'm basically going into this area and just trying to create enough definition to to bring it to a finish but not so much that as I said I detract from the uh, the head the focal point um, so yeah trying to find that balance always there we go light back on and now we're into quite fine details here I love the way that the kind of the, the nose ridge um, around the black marking because of where the light is coming from, it casts this beautiful shadow over the face of the cheetah in this area. And because it's a cast shadow, that means that the line between light and shadow is quite sharp. Look at the way that little mark I just did a minute ago coming off to the left of the dark line coming out of the eye. That's a cast shadow, so I simply just glaze that strong shadow straight over that area. I don't need to blend it. Whereas if we look at the shadow coming around the cheek of the cheetah into the eye socket area, that was purposely created softer because that's a form shadow. That's a shadow that's been created as we go around the form of the cheetah's cheek from the light eye socket around into the shadow side of the kind of skull area. So we've got two different types of shadow there in one small area that make it work and make it interesting. We've got cast shadows and we've got form shadows. So that's always something to look out for. And we're into the kind of the, um, I guess you would call them the details, right? I, I try to stay away from using the word detail purely for my own benefit more than anything else. And um, I just think of it as the smaller shapes, which I know is, a, is just a, a silly way of saying detail, but as soon as I think detail, I start getting too fussy. I start overworking areas. If I just think, right, small, simple shapes, just like we did big, simple shapes, medium, simple shapes. We're now just painting simple shapes, but they're a touch smaller. And I find that just keeps me on track with not getting too bogged down in the details, which isn't what I want to do. And I'm just just in this area, which is basically the focal point of the whole painting. I'm just taking a little bit more care little bit more time with the smaller brush and I'm looking for some very very gentle slightly cooler cast shadows so that lovely white around the eye of the cheetah has a few shadows falling across it because of the eye socket because of things like eyelashes the the, the ridge of the nose and stuff to some gentle colors kind of falling around so just that little play of shadow in that area for me has really brought it to life and then we've got a nice contrast of kind of soft and hard light and dark and now something that I've been um, gently considering in the back of my head for a while is what am I going to do with the background I love the soft color almost like a purpley blue in the background of the photo I think that works really nicely so I'm going to use that as a guide it's quite muted so I'm mixing the blue and the red together initially but I'm also a glazing over yellow with a transparent wash with purple so those two will kind of cancel each other out a bit and give a slightly more grayish tone which is no bad thing um, and I'm also dropping a touch of yellow in where I want things to go um, a little bit more subdued so the main thing here is being very careful with the negative shape of the background and how it influences the positive shape of the cheetah's face it would be so easy here to cut in to the head of the cheetah or not cut in enough um, or too much and and completely alter the shape here so you can see at the moment i've just chopped off uh, or straightened out the nose a little bit too much and it's so easy to especially with big cats where we need that 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 nose shape is so important um, to make it look like a cheetah as opposed to any other big cat I really need to be careful here and I just took that little extra moment to then round it back off again um, and instantly goes back to looking a little bit more like a cheetah. It's very subtle uh, and we don't need to obsess about it too much but do be wary of negative shapes in backgrounds or any negative shape and when you're painting that how is that affecting the positive shape in this case the nose and the muzzle of the cheetah. So I tend to start a little bit lighter with my background washes and then when I'm confident I've kind of found my way with them I then come in with stronger pigment and start dropping it in. I'm trying to find a kind of soft transition 
between um, light and shadow. I need to be very careful here. I don't start muddying the pigment. Notice how I've made a bit of a meal of it. So I go back in with a lot of water and kind of wash it out a little bit. Really dangerous because it's in the focal point. You can see I'm kind of hurrying to get back to it as quick as possible. Uh, there we go. And I, I chuck in the quinacridone red. What I'm doing here is quite risky in watercolour and you can only do this when there's a lot of water on the page, otherwise you're going to muddy the pigment. So I chucked a load of water at it, kind of washed it back out again. Uh, and now I'm just trying to connect it all back together to create one unified wash. Much, much happier with the colour and the tone and the quality of that wash. Um, so once it's dried a bit, you, you're in a bit more trouble, harder to come back from that. But you can wash it out again and then pull it out with kitchen rolls. So it's not the end of the world. But I'm so much happier with that wash than I was a minute ago. And what I'm trying to do now, which is quite tricky, is give the illusion of um, kind of the light grass coming up into the more shadowy background. Um, I think basically I didn't like the blue that I'd used, although it was more more close to the photo. I just didn't like it as much. Uh, and I've spoken before in other videos about, you know, we we can all be experts on colour to some extent but we're just an expert because it's okay to just say well do I like that colour or not not so much does it fit the photo but asking myself like in the context of the painting do I actually like the colour I've just created and I didn't like the colour that I'd used in the background it I felt it was too heavy and too bluey and I'm much happier with the kind of more ready purple colour now. It's not what I had planned, but it's something I've kind of decided as I've gone along. And I feel like it, it keeps the painting in a much kind of warmer bias on the whole. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to achieve. Notice how I've not brought the background around the top head area of the cheetah. The reason is that I really like the way the colour from the head of the cheetah has kind of bled uh, and and it's flowed into the colour around the top of the cheetah. Now, to be fair, the, the pencil line that I've left in there is very important because it gives us the edge of the head. Uh, and so I made a, a decision there, which I don't always make. Sometimes I want to do it with tone, so it's more painterly. But I made a decision here to actually let the pencil line dictate the edge there so that it allowed me that blush of orange between the cheetah and the background to stay there. And I really like that in this case. In another painting, it may have been different, but in this one, I really like that feature. So I kept it and it took quite a lot of discipline. And people often ask me about leaving pencil lines. I quite like seeing pencil lines. I wouldn't want to see them everywhere and too heavy necessarily, but it's purely personal taste. But still, compared to some people, I actually really like seeing the pencil lines Um uh, and they can, at times, be a really useful part of the painting. Um, I don't always plan, or don't, I don't ever plan to use the pencil lines um, to complete or show an edge. But sometimes they naturally get, get um, used to show an edge, and this is a good example of that. My most recent video, I also talk about edges in relation between the, uh, the cheetah and, uh, or the, the object and the background. Thinking about kind of, um, I definitely recommend you hop back and have a look at it, but thinking about shadow against shadow, then light against shadow, which we've got plenty of. We've got shadow against shadow at the back of the cheetah. We've got the front edge of the cheetah. The focal point is light against shadow. Um, we then have um, shadow against light of the cheetah. So if you look at the ear, the top part of the neck of the cheetah, where it's in shadow, I've left the background there much lighter. So we've got shadow against light. And the very final edge, which I spoke about in the most recent video as being um, a, an interesting one to look for and one that often gets missed by myself, is light against light. Uh, and so notice how I've left the top of the part of the forehead of the cheetah there, kind of light against light at the background. And also the front edge of the chest of the cheetah, there's definitely... Um, light against light there, although there is a bit of a pencil line which shows the edge, but tonally it's kind of light against light. So we've got the four different types of edges. I'm just using a tiny touch of gouache here. I don't like to use too much gouache, but it can be a really useful tool, but it's also very easy to, um, to really make a mess with it. I just popped a little light on the top of the ear, 
just to pop it out a bit more. I wasn't so happy with a little shadow that I'd run along the top edge of the eye socket. So I just put a tiny bit of white gouache there. You could use Chinese white, you could use uh, titanium white um, of the actual watercolour itself. And of course there is a whole kind of traditional side of watercolour that are very against using opaque white. Um, but there's many, 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 many artists that do, plenty of my favourites. And I'm certainly of the opinion like a little bit of opaque white here and there uh, can really transform a painting. And if it's the difference between a painting working or not, or the difference between you liking a painting or not, then I, I'm a big supporter of doing it. However, it is very easy to overuse white. You know, I've been very reserved. There's probably one or two spots where I've used it. Um, well, two, two or three spots where I've, I've used it. Top of the ear, touch around the eye. Uh, and I just tried to get some of those whiskers in. But actually, I didn't really like them too much. So I've pretty much painted them out. Um, and that's really it. You, you need to be very, very careful. It's very easy to go around and put it everywhere. And it looks like we've just put Tipex on. Um, it's no substitute for the whites of the page, uh, but it can be a really useful tool. And then very finally here, while the wash is nearly dry, I just used my um, my fingernail to very quickly and sharply pull out a couple of little marks for the whiskers. And, um, and that's basically it, the finishing touches of the piece. Uh, it's... It's got the real feel that I wanted in the final piece of the painting. It's got light and shadow to it. It's got a really strong um, kind of warm feeling. For me, it's a nice combination of softer, more kind of abstract areas mixed with areas that are kind of a little bit more defined and sharper and tighter. I'm really happy with how the face has turned out. It's got the, the illusion of kind of complexity, but actually it's still very simple in terms of light and shadow there's basically lights and highlights there's a gentle medium shadow and then there's the deeper dark shadows and the markings uh, there's kind of three stages to the light there uh, and overall I'm, I'm really really happy with it and I also think as I said it was a great example of how to simplify what appears to be a complex subject down into just simple patterns of light and shadow the the spots themselves are almost a, a secondary consideration over the top um, and then really understanding the, the role of paint consistency here. Uh, how wet is the wash on the page? How much pigment and water do I have in my brush? And how do those interact with each other? So that's it guys, I hope you really enjoyed that. I had a huge amount of fun painting that. Big cats have become one of my absolute favorite subjects to paint of recent times in watercolor. As I said before, please do consider subscribing. Feel free to give me a thumbs up, drop me a little comment. Don't forget you can see links to all of the other places you can find me, Patreon, my online watercolour school that's coming up next year, uh, social media, Zoom demonstrations, all of that stuff in the description. Until next time guys, happy living, happy painting and I will catch you very soon.